Um, I'm Robin Graham. I am the Associate Deputy Director for Computing, Environment, and Life Sciences. And I'm very pleased to welcome you here today to uh, Argonne's Out Loud presentation. It's really a pleasure for me to introduce tonight's speaker because of his reputation, and he's a great guy to work with, too. He's a proven leader who, over the last 25 years, has collaborated with scientists and colleagues from industry, from universities and national labs all over the world. I know because I have to approve his foreign travel. <laughs> Um, he works on large-scale and distributed computing systems. He joined Argonne in 2002 as the director of engineering and the chief architect for the TerraGrid, which he may be explaining. In this role, he designed and deployed the world's most powerful grid computing system for linking production of high-performance computing centers for the National Science Foundation. And then from 2008 in, he served as the director of the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility, where he successfully deployed the IBM Blue Gene Q, I mean P system. The Q system is what we've got now, and that was one of the fastest, uh, one of the world's fastest supercomputers, um, and he delivered it way ahead of schedule. In 2010, he was named director of Argonne's Exascale Technology and Computing Institute where he works with scientists and industrial partners from around the world to develop exascale computing for the purpose of scientific discovery and solving some of the nation's really critical scientific problems. Before Argonne, he worked for industry. Um, the research laboratory that he founded in 2000 in Santa Fe, New Mexico, devel developed the world's first dynamic provisioning systems for clusters. And, and for that, he was at Los Alamos National Laboratory, where he founded the Advanced Computing Laboratory's Linux cluster team. He's won several professional awards and served on numerous advisory committees and um, off serving as the chair. Tonight, he's gonna be telling us about the really rapidly changing world of supercomputing and how it's changing our own world. Let me introduce Pete Beckman. Thank you very much. All right, let's get started here. So uh, tonight we're going to uh, be talking about uh, sort of what's happening in technology and supercomputers and what Argonne's role in that is and sort of what's changing uh, over the next few years and really what's happened over the last uh, 20 years as well. So we're actually going to start uh, uh, a little bit back in time. But uh, let me give you a very brief overview. Uh, those of you who, I guess, made it through the guard gate uh, uh, <laughs> came in and see our fantastic building right there. Argonne is home to about 3,500 employees. Uh, there are about uh, 750 PhDs who work here at Argonne. And uh, our budget is about uh, $800 million a year. So it's a, it's a pretty fantastic laboratory here in Illinois. And uh, it's a fantastic campus as well. Uh, uh, you can see this wooded campus. You're able to go out and walk around. It's voted consistently one of the best places for postdocs to come uh, and work uh, here at Los Alamos. It's, or I mean, at, at Argonne. <laughs> I, I, I did work at Los Alamos, so that one's OK. So, uh, um, uh, so one of the things that we're uh, uh, known for is in addition to the science that, that scientists here do, uh, we also host facilities. So a facility is something that anyone who is a f scientist who is uh, in their area and distinguished in their area can ask for time and get access on one of our facilities. So our supercomputer facility, for example, is open in some sense to the public. If you're a scientist at a laboratory or even at a university, uh, or uh, even in another country, you can apply for and get time on our supercomputer through a competitive process if your science is great and your computing is good. We have a, a whole number of research areas. Some of you may recognize uh, 
the one up in the top, the uh, uh, tandem linear accelerator system, uh, one of the things that Argon does in addition to fantastic computing is, you know, you can, may recognize this, we're also responsible for creating superheroes. Uh, you know, the Hulk, uh, Argon, uh, Spider-Man, Argon, Tony Stark, he was a grad student here. Um, I, Oak Ridge had Lex Luthor, uh, but uh, um, <laughs> Argon uh, has all the, the good, good ones. So uh, we're going to now wind back the clock to start talking about supercomputing. We're really going to start at the very beginning. Now, if you go way back, we're talking a thousand, more than a thousand years, you had calculating instruments. Now, these are not supercomputers. They're not computers. They're really calculating instruments. And there's, we're going to talk about the fundamental difference between a computer and a calculating instrument. So these on the, uh, on the right here are a type of slide rule. And uh, in fact, you can still buy slide rules, although I'm not sure many people know how to use a slide rule anymore. But you can get a slide rule. And uh, it was a very simple way to do computation, to do calculations. But it isn't a computer, although it is pretty clear that, that these sort of things will continue into the future. Even into the, into the 23rd century, you might end up using a slide rule. Um, so, you know, computers don't replace all forms of calculating. So now if we look forward after these simple calculating devices came what, what we refer to as automatons. Now these are also not computers, but they're getting close. So these uh, in the 1800s, folks realized how to automate things and create a set of instructions. So here, for example, on the right is a music box. And the set of instructions is on this drum and is able to program what happens with the bird, with the chimes. Uh, if you've seen the movie Hugo, you see a classic automaton being able to draw a picture with, a, with an arm the real invention of computer science, uh, of computing. And this happened in the mid-30s and led into uh, World War II. And it's made most famous by a, uh, a British man named Alan Turing. And he worked very hard on cracking the German encryption system known as Enigma, the Enigma machine. And at that time, this fantastic machine was uh, is, is sort of uh, beautiful in its complexity of the code. And so they worked very hard to, to break that code. But along the way, as he pondered what is necessary to essentially encrypt and code things, he came upon the idea of what a real computer would be. Now, it's a paper design. He didn't build it. He actually only had the right ideas. And his paper idea was that you could build a computer, the simplest concept of a construct for a computing device is simply a piece of paper tape and a head which can look at that paper tape and say is it a zero is it a one is it a blank and based on that either move to the left move to the right or write a zero or a one that's all it could do it doesn't have any addition built in doesn't have subtraction no multiplication nothing else just look left look right, I mean, uh, read the, read the uh, tape, move left, move right, write a one, write a zero. And if you can build that, that's called a Turing machine, if you can build that simple device, that's sufficient to compute anything that's computable. Now that is a, I mean, if, there, if this were, you know, Space Odyssey 2001, a monolith would come down right about now. Because that concept was the, is fundamental to computing, is that this piece, having a little bit of storage, that's the tape, having a program which determines whether something is there, whether it's not, write a one, write a zero, that's sufficient to compute anything. Even what we compute with our supercomputer can be computed with that. Now, it would take way too long, <laughs> and that's not how we build computers, but that concept is very important in computer science because it leads us to what is computable and what isn't computable. So now, some of you may be able to read what's here in blue, right? Uh, those of you who are reading it ahead, you should be able to read it. There are only two kinds of people in the world, those who understand binary and those who don't. Okay, so binary is the base two, is the numeric system by which computers operate because rather than having each 
digit in the computer being 0 to 9 or 10 positions, it's much easier to build something that's a 0 or a 1. But then you need more digits. So it takes us 64 binary digits, 64 bits, in order to encode a floating point value, 3.7 to the 20th power. So we need a few more places, but then it's very easy to do inside a computer. Now, Argon immediately started building computers, even back to 1953. This was the first computer. It was called Avidac. Uh, it was built for about a quarter million dollars, and it was uh, uh, operated here by, you see someone there, w their hand is on a switch. They're about to toggle in a program to uh, put the program in by raising and lowering and creating the instructions uh, right there along the way. Von Neumann was the man who realized that the program shouldn't come from punched cards, but should actually be stored in memory as well. So we call all of these systems that have this architecture a Von Neumann architecture. That means that the computer program is in memory. Now, of course, that's the case now. Uh, it, it, we all have Von Neumann architectures. But back then, that was a pretty revolutionary idea. Now, I've brought you from calculating machines, tabulating machines, the first computer, uh, the first kinds of computers. Here at Argonne, we had one of the first. I did leave out one part of the story. Um, now, it's kind of a, a little bit of a, a fantastic part of the story. I'm not sure if any of you have uh, uh, heard of steampunks. Have you ever heard of that or seen these people who dress up as steampunks? Um, these are people who sort of imagine a Victorian world with big steam engines and brass fittings and goggles and uh, springs and levers. And uh, they're sometimes now dressing up and going to the Ren Fair. And uh, where do they get these crazy ideas? Well, they actually get them from looking back at science fiction. So they're reimagining these folks. They're called steampunks. They're reimagining science fiction, the time of H.G. Wells and the time machine of... Uh, um, uh, uh, Captain Nemo and the Nautilus uh, from Jules Verne. And it is actually in this time period that we really have the first computer. This is a calculating device that is really the first calculating device of its kind. Now, this is rebuilt. All the plans for this calculating device had been preserved. It's called the Difference Engine, made by a man named called Charles Babbage. And you can see this device here that has a big handle probably a mahogany or <laughs> rosewood. You know, this is the time when you've had engineers really working and making it look good as well. And by cranking this handle, you could compute tables. Now, at that time, this machine wasn't really a general purpose computer, but he had designed on paper after he saw, the, after he was able to create this, he designed on paper and realized that you could make something that could be much more general. And he made the design for something called the analytical engine. And it had real punched cards, but it was never built. But even just the paper design of that gave birth to the very, what we consider now, to be the very first computer programmer. It was Ada uh, Lovelace. So a woman was the first computer programmer. At that time, because it didn't exist, it was a design. Her program was written in the margin of a technical paper that described the, the computer. And she wrote how to calculate Bernoulli numbers in the margin by using this new program, by, by writing a program for this. Right now, this was developed, uh, sort of rebuilt from the design in 1991. People are hoping that they can eventually uh, uh, build the, uh, the real deal, which is the analytic engine. Now, I have a quote from Charles Babbage that I wanted to uh, share because it's, it's so wonderful. Uh, it's sort of British English, so you'll have to sort of follow along carefully. Uh, but it does describe how early on people were confused about what computers could really do. Even this sort of computer, even one that's all physical with gears and camshafts and there's no electricity at all. So here's what uh, Charles said. On two occasions I've been asked, pray, Mr. Babbage, if I put into the machine wrong figures, will the right answers come out? <laughs> His rep Charles Babbage goes on. I am not able rightly to apprehend the kind of confusion of ideas that could provoke such a question. <laughs> so, uh, you know, in fact, he also apparently, uh, you know, was the author of Garbage In, Garbage Out, uh, um, uh, said more eloquently in, in British English. 
so this gives us now the concept of the computer gives us this capability to write programs and work on data. And a program is really a, an algorithm. It's a set of steps that work in a particular way. And a good example of this is how you uh, might sort uh, um, envelopes. So let's say you printed out a thousand envelopes for some mass mailing. You go to the post office and the, the post office tells you, well, you know, you'll get a discount on the postage if you give them to us in sorted order, zip code sorted order. <coughs> so you go back and you say, okay, how do I do this? Well, you pull the first envelope out and you lay it on the ground. You pull the second envelope out and you say, is it bigger or smaller as a zip code? And then you put it down. And then you pull the next envelope out and you start and you insert it into the right place. It's the same way that you might sort your bridge hand if you were playing bridge. So this is an algorithm and it's those algorithms that we use. We create algorithms to do science, to do uh, work with a computer. The other algorithms that I'm sure you're familiar with, sort of search engine algorithms, page rank algorithms is what uh, Google uses. Uh, it's also, we found out in computing science, it's very important that there are some things that are computable easily and some things that are astronomically difficult. And it isn't always easy or uh, to understand why one is hard and why one is easy. So for example, Calculating pi to the billionth decibel, easy. It may take time, it may take some tricky algorithms, but actually easy. The following problem is actually very hard. If I were to ask everyone in the room here, uh, I want to figure out an algorithm to find five people in the room whose age adds up to 200. That turns out to be an extraordinarily difficult thing to find. You have to essentially take every possible combination in order to do that. There's no easy way to do it. So it turns out that one of the things in computing is that some things are easy to compute, pi, some of the things like gravity, other things, and some things are astronomically totally difficult. And we actually rely on that. So encryption is one of those things that we rely on the fact that it's really difficult to compute. That way no one can break an encrypted file. No one can get in. So we rely on the fact that some things are are essentially nearly impossible to compute. Okay, so now we're at the point where we have algorithms, we have programs, we have computers, and now here is when maybe the second big 2001 monolith would come down. We have microprocessors. And very quickly we moved from uh, computing or sort of these tabulating machines. This is a relay, just an electromagnetic relay. And we have uh, tubes. I had to send away to my dad to find this tube uh, uh, since I don't have any anymore. Although Joe, who helped me out, ha uh, has a uh, uh, old-fashioned guitar amp and people are now getting retro with their guitar amps and going back to tubes uh, to get sort of the guitar amp sound. So we suddenly came up with the microprocessor. And what's amazing about this is the, the rate at which things shrink. So Gordon Moore was one of the co-founders of Intel, and he very early in the mid-60s realized that the technology that we're using to create microchips, to put transistors on a chip, about every year and a half, we're able to double the number of transistors. And the speed at which we've made more powerful chips every year, there's nothing else on the planet. Nothing else comes close to the... Uh, jump in performance, the jump in capability that we have with microchips. So let me give you an example. So back in about uh, uh, turn of the century, a Model T could go uh, 40 miles an hour. If you buy a car today, 100 years later, uh, even if it was a fantastic car, it might go 240 miles an hour. That's only a factor of six. We have with computing factors of millions from uh, the time we first started with computing to what we have now. And we seem to be doubling this capability every couple years. In fact, the reason that you are always confused by mega, giga, tera, peta is precisely because we're always adding more power and always going to the next level. Uh, it's quite remarkable. Uh, the first uh, microprocessor had about 2,300 transistors. Now, if you think about those as people, that would be about 2,300 people we could fit in this building, no problem. Today, 
microprocessors have the 7 billion transistors, the equivalent of the entire population of the Earth crammed into this building. That's this, the difference in the expansion that we've had putting transistors on chips. And that's what gives us the power to create supercomputers, which we're going to get to right now. So here we are looking up, looking back in time at the Big Bang, and we're looking at uh, uh, the creation of the universe. There are certain laws that happen when the universe was created. The, uh, uh, very quickly after the first few moments, it seems that gravity and other things sort of came into being, time itself. And the universe behaves in very predictable ways. We're able to write down, in fact, uh, using good theory, we're able to write down how the universe behaves. We have how gravity works. We've able to figure that out, uh, how uh, energy, how much energy has when something collides into something else. We even have a quantum effect, Schrodinger's equation. So we, by writing down these equations now and having the power of computers, what we're able to do is put those equations into the computer and simulate and able to uh, uh, look at what happens with real data or even simulated data in the computer. So we've moved in how we do science from experiment, this is the uh, Yerkes uh, telescope up in Wisconsin, uh, so from taking observations, experimental observations, to what we would call theory. In fact, you know that Einstein and other folks who were theoreticians work with you know, old-fashioned chalk and a chalkboard, and it isn't many, often until many years later they're able to actually prove whether that happens, whether that is the, what they predicted in theory. And now we have another tool, uh, computing. And the physics, so the computing that you see here and we've, we've uh, out in the hall that you may have seen, that computing is essentially encoding those physical laws that we understand and putting them in the computer. Now, some of you may have played a game that's sort of physics-based uh, that has these laws coded in. Uh, you may recognize uh, Angry Birds. So Angry Birds is a fantastic example, actually, of how physics is coded into a computer program. So here's an example of Angry Birds. Uh, and this is not quite real because, in this case, gravity, which is represented by this circle here, has a fixed uh, 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 range. Real gravity doesn't. Uh, but you launch birds into this fixed gravity well. They spiral around. And then, then they smash into things, and these things have centers of gravity, they have friction, they roll, they topple. So they've encoded the physics into this uh, application. In fact, uh, if we were going to play this application on the computer here, we would need a giant size slingshot. And uh, let's see now if we can... Uh, we would uh, be able to fire up our giant size slingshot. <laughs> And now we're, the slingshot here is, uh, is uh, because we're here at Argonne, we want to make sure that we would never use a slingshot without a pair of safety glasses. So, uh, so we're ready here. So now let me say that what we have here in this slingshot is uh, one of the postdocs here at Argonne has put together a circuit which connects the axes of this slingshot, the tilt, and the pressure with which I hold the slingshot to my laptop. So it's actually wired into the laptop. Raj is sitting here hoping that this all works and that I don't uh, break it for him. But we're going to give this a try just so you get the feel for what's happening here. And let's see how we do in Angry Birds. And oh, we even get great sound effects. Let's see here. Oh, there we go. Okay. Excellent. And I am not going to try and duplicate that again, so we'll do that afterwards. All right. Let's see here. Oh, we've got to turn our Angry Birds off here. Oh, I see. Oh, thanks. There we go. All right. 
Oh, I can take my safety glasses off now, I believe. So uh, before we go on, we should give Raj a hand here for uh, <laughs> helping me out with that. Now, again, the, the point of that demonstration is that the way we use computers is we code those equations. The reason Angry Birds works, the reason there is an elliptical orbit, the reason it smashes in is we've encoded the formulas that we understand about physics and created a simulation. Now, some of you are thinking, so what Pete does is play Angry Birds <laughs> on a supercomputer. No, we don't have Angry Birds with a supercomputer. Um, but it is that style of simulation that we're actually running on our computers. Now, uh, we've been adding more and more transistors to the chips every year. The question is, is there a point at which the chip becomes too big? Do you, is it really worthwhile to build yet another single processor, another single chip? Those of you might recognize uh, the Spruce Goose, Howard Hughes plane. At some point, building a single computer, a single chip, becomes too unwieldy, and instead, you use lots of small planes to carry your cargo. So in computing, the thing that we do with supercomputers that's different than with a regular computer is that we have to divide our problem up and design algorithms, design ways to solve problems using hundreds of thousands of CPUs. So this is a very simple example to uh, explain what a parallel algorithm is. So if I were to ask someone, if I, I won't ask for volunteers, but if I asked for a volunteer and said, I need you to add up a thousand numbers for me. Here's a sheet of paper, add up this thousand numbers. You would have to run off and do 999 additions. Hopefully you're now figuring out why you don't have to do a thousand additions. But you have to do 999 additions. Now each of one of those additions we call a flop, not because it uh, doesn't work well, but it's a floating point operation. So if you had four computers, you might take that sheet of paper, tear it into fourths, give a fourth of each of those to one of the computers, and say, go to work. Each of those computers would do 249 additions, but then at the end, you'd have to add up the results across the top and send a message to finish it all up. That's a parallel algorithm. This is a serial algorithm. So now we have a computer next door that has more than 700,000 cores. So now imagining not dividing things up between four processors, but 700,000. So now this algorithm that I've shown here has a real problem. This algorithm, even the one I showed here, is not scalable because the way I've designed it is at the end, you have to send from processor one to processor two to processor three all the way to more than 700,000. So we have to do something else. But this demonstrates how a parallel algorithm is different from the algorithms that we have now. So who writes these algorithms? Who writes this sort of software? Well, Argon. Uh, as I said, we started back in 1953 with the first computer here, but even shortly thereafter, uh, we started a applied math group, and that applied math group eventually led to the first math and computer science department here at Argonne. This is one of the sort of family photos. There's uh, at least one person in the audience who is in this picture, and, and you'll be challenged later to find out who that person is. Uh, there's a couple employees of Argonne who are still on this picture. Uh, who still come in every day. This was taken in 1983-ish, about. And we were creating software to run on supercomputers. And that is what we do today, is that we write those parallel algorithms. And they're really like puzzles. You can think of this uh, much in the way of Sudoku, is to write the algorithm, you don't need a computer. You can write the algorithm on a piece of paper. You can sit and think about, like, like Ada Lovelace did, just think about what is the most efficient set of operations we can do. Now, because these machines are so large, we can't go to the store and buy software for them. You can't go and, and load up Microsoft Windows on our machine. Uh, you may not want to load it on any machine, but you wouldn't load it on our machine. And uh, so even the operating system is custom. We write the operating system or we partner with a company to write the operating system. Now, this is our newest arrival. Uh, it is Mira. It is a blue jean Q. And when you were coming in, you may have seen that there was a poster there that IBM 
got awarded the Presidential Sort of uh, Technology Medal of Honor for their work on Blue Gene series. IBM and Argonne and Lawrence Livermore Laboratory partnered to create the design for this machine. Again, because this is a specialized area, you don't go to Best Buy to pick up one of these, uh, it really takes a partnership between the scientists who have the applications, who are doing that physics, and the vendor who work together. Now, we have a supercomputer here that's housed in a division called the ALCF, the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility. There are two such facilities in the nation. Chicago, ours here at Argonne, and the other is in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Those are the only two Department of Energy facilities for this massive style supercomputing for open science. There are laboratories that have big computers as well that are used for uh, security and, and, uh, and weapons science. Okay, so let's take a look on the inside. This is uh, looking in uh, Blue Gene Q. Now, uh, um, I included a picture here that I know the, the sysadmins who you met, some of you met outside, may not like, but down here underneath the floor you see them uh, working on the machine and they have a big bucket there and that's because uh, this machine is water cooled and there actually is water that they <laughs> sometimes you might have to drain, uh, that there's water flowing through the boards to keep the machine cool. Each one of the nodes looks like this. This is a compute node and uh, we have close to 50,000 of these compute nodes and they have little connectors that allow you to fasten them into a piece of the computer that keeps it cold by running cold water through here. The entire machine takes four to five uh, megawatts of power so you know you can tell there's a lot of power being dissipated in our machine room. Now it's sometimes people ask, well, how does it compare to a laptop? How, how powerful is your computer? So now this is a little bit unfair because it's saying, okay, well, if I wanted to compare my speedboat to an aircraft carrier, uh, you know, how do they compare? Well, you can't fly a plane onto your speedboat. Uh, so they don't really compare in that way. But to give you an idea of the kind of relative sizes, my laptop is a very, very, very fast laptop. It's one of the fastest Apple laptops uh, that you can get. And uh, if I stacked laptop after laptop after laptop up to sort of equal the computing power of uh, this machine, it would be about 1.7 miles high. So taking my laptop and sort of stacking it up, equaling Mira. But that's not really sort of the important measure. The real important measure is time. So the reason we use computers like this is because we want to compute things that we couldn't compute with my laptop. So one day of time, if I were to use Mira for one day and run my program on it all day, morning, all the way back around to the next morning, is equal to running, if I could fit the problem, I can't fit it on here, but if I could run it on my laptop, it would take me 300 years. So it's not just a matter of being faster, it means that I can actually do different problems. I can investigate things that I couldn't investigate. Now, I have to say right up front, this is like way cooler than the Higgs boson. Just, uh, <laughs> just saying. Okay, so how does uh, a supercomputer like this get built? Well, it's completely modular. So it's built up in modules. You start with one of these, and it has 16 cores on it plus two extra. And then they go into that chassis that you saw out there. And those chassis, which are very heavy because they have copper pipes, go into a half rack, which then goes into a full rack, which then eventually gets laid out on the floor and all those cables. It's just a sea of cables underneath uh, with all those racks and all those orange optical cables. So how does, you know, what is happening in the world of computing? Well, there are actually computers all over the world of this size. Uh, Argonne right now is the fourth uh, largest. Uh, when we fielded the one previous to this, Intrepid, it was the fastest of the open science supercomputers. Now the one on top right now uh, um, isn't working, uh, so, so our ranking really should be going up, but uh, uh, we'll let them explain that. Uh, now you'll also notice that there's lots of countries that are represented. So supercomputing is a very competitive. Every nation realizes that the ability to simulate and uh, work on the very edge of technology and understand climate and understand what's possible is very important both for the future technology of that, of that country but also uh, its science, what it can do. 
So let's look at that, what's happened over the last uh, several decades. This is a chart now, first let me explain, this is a log chart, which means that for every line up on the left in the y-axis, it's a factor of 10. So uh, this is the exponential growth leveled out into a linear line, and this shows the top 500 supercomputers since 19, about 1993. And you can see in the blue line, it's the sum of all the power of those 500 computers. The red line is the fastest computer, the fastest is shown in the red line, and the green line is sort of the bottom, the slowest of the 500 fastest. And you can see that we're on this trajectory here, which looks like, well, we're going to just keep going right off the top there. Uh, we're doing pretty well. Well, there's some complications we're going to get to as we sort of go off the top there. But the first thing to note is sort of where technology ends up. So if I were to pull out my iPad, it turns out that my iPad could have been one of the top 500 computers in the world in about 1995. So one way to look at supercomputing is that supercomputing is a time machine. What we build here in the laboratory 20 years later ends up on your iPhone. So if we look even further as an example of my laptop, my laptop is 73 gigaflops per second. That means 73 uh, um, billion uh, uh, operations per second. That's faster than the computer that we had at Los Alamos. In 1993, it was called the CM5. Uh, it had a lot of red blinky lights. Some of you may recognize this was in the background at the Jurassic Park movie. You know, the uh, supercomputer back there that they calculated the DNA with. This was th that computer and uh, called the uh, Thinking Machine CM5. And at that time, it was the fastest computer in the world, and my laptop is now faster. So over 20 years, over that course of 20 years, uh, we've taken what has been developed, you know, uh, as the best in the nation, the best in the world, and it gets delivered now you know, through all the uh, processes to the consumer. It's quite amazing. Uh, and we're able to also look at what countries are doing. Now, this is an aggregate number of where all the supercomputers are. And uh, one thing you notice, boy, there's a purple line there that has a different trajectory than all the other lines. That's China's investment. And if you look at China's investment compared to all of Europe, you can see that they've almost uh, uh, you know, eclipsed all of Europe. For a short period of time, they had the number one and number three machines in the world. And so you can see that this is a very competitive uh, area of science where uh, the best folks in Europe, in Japan, in China are competing to build the biggest machines but also do the most science. Okay, so now we're going to take a quick moment and uh, uh, see if we can pull this up here. And uh, All right. So we have a, very, a couple short videos of some of the scientific results that were run. Some were run on Blue Gene Q, our machine here, and some were run on Intrepid, which is the previous machine that's in production. So we're going to start. Let's see if this... Uh, there we go. This is a simulation uh, done by uh, Warren Washington and crew, and it's a simulation of climate. Now, this is not weather. Weather is what happens tomorrow or in two days. This is sort of looking way out into the future and trying to get the modeling and simulation of the planet so that we can understand uh, the weather, uh, what will become the future climate for the, for the world. So we're looking here, you can see the clock ticking. This is again a future case. It was taken from real data to start, but it's projecting forward. And you can see as we get here in sort of August, uh, right about now is the time, the hurricane season. So we sit, see September. These are uh, examples. Also, if you look over here in Japan, cyclones. Uh, and so we're able to model the Earth and what's happening with climate, and we can understand the processes. These sort of simulations include modeling for ice, modeling for the water, modeling for the atmosphere, modeling for the land mass, and they combine all of these in order to do the simulation. This is a simulation that General Electric uh, did on our computer, and it's a simulation of a turbine, a, a jet engine. And this is not a picture of the exhaust, 
but they're really interested in the turbulence behind the jet engine. And the reason for that is that turbulence uh, contributes to two things, both of which are annoying. The first is it is a major uh, problem, a contributor to fuel efficiency. You want to reduce turbulence. The second is it is a contributor to sound. It's what causes that jet engine to roar. So by reducing the turbulence, we improve fuel efficiency and we make the planes quieter. So here they're looking at the flow and they're trying to understand where the turbulence is happening and by modeling it. Now this is actually, in real time, this would be about 10 milliseconds of, uh, of real exhaust, of real uh, 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 engine action. And they're able to model and understand. In this particular picture, vorticity means how fast it's spinning. What's the, uh, the, the spin of the turbulence uh, at the back of the engine? And we're going to see here, uh, sort of looking down the nozzle, looking straight in uh, as well as a slice moves through. Uh, this was, again, done by General Electric uh, uh, using our computers here at Argonne to try and design better uh, turbines. Um, the next one you're going to see is the m simulation that's the largest ever galaxy simulation ever done. It was done on our Blue Jean Q uh, down the hall. And this was done by Salman uh, Habib and, uh, and uh, 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 Katrin uh, Heitman. And this shows the, er or the, the universe uh, at about uh, 1.6 billion years old. Now the total age of the universe is about 13.7. And we're sort of zooming in to show the area. This particular uh, simulation is done to study dark energy. And it takes into account uh, dark energy. In fact, really only about 0.7% of, uh, of what's in the universe is visible that we can see. So these simulations allow them to look at the structure that evolves from writing those equations down on the blackboard these are uh, really essentially writing down the equations for understanding our galaxy and then putting them into the computer and simulating them a little bit more uh, uh, rigor done than Angry Birds, uh, but it's the same concept. And the final one here is one from medicine. So this is takes and couples two codes. This is a picture of someone's brain. This is actual picture of the uh, arteries in your brain. And this particular brain has an aneurysm. It's that lump the big bulb there. And they've taken a fluid dynamics computation, and this is from uh, George Karnadakis at uh, Brown, and they're looking at the fluid movement <coughs> inside the aneurysm, and then they're going to introduce another code that models platelets, because it is the uh, adhesion of the platelets in this region. You're going to see it zoom in now. It's the adhesion of the platelets in this region that can trigger and damage that region and eventually cause a rupture. And so what doctors want to know is by looking and simulating what is actually happening, understanding the process that's happening here. And if they understand this properly, then by looking at MRI information, they might be able to predict whether or not they should treat or not, whether they need to do something preemptively or just wait. Okay, let's go back here. Okay, so now let's r start m pushing forward past what we can do today and look at exascale. So exascale is another factor of a thousand from sort of where we are today. And uh, if you look uh, here at where the dotted line would cross, you'd say, oh, well, we're just going to wait. We could just sit here and wait. 2019, machines will be that fast. But we have a problem. I said that we kept shrinking the, the transistors. They're getting smaller and smaller every year. Well, it turns out that we've, we're coming close to tapping some of the areas where we get performance. So you may have noticed, for example, that the, when you go to the store to buy a computer, the clock speed is never any faster. It's the same clock speed you could buy two years ago. It's the same clock speed you could buy three years ago. It's about 3.5, 3.6 gigahertz, and that's it. For a long period of time, we kept adding to the clock speed. And so if you look here, green, this line here, the frequency, we've tipped the corner here, and we're not going to go any faster. The reason we can't go any faster is because it takes way too much electrical power to go faster. Our machines would become, uh, 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 you know, we would need an entire refrigeration unit, even for your laptop, if you wanted to start cranking the, the clock speed up. There are a bunch of other things that have sort of tipped over. 
Uh, and what has happened instead, the way we're compensating, is the number of cores, the number of computing units in your computer is going way up. So you notice that, for example, you buy a computer now, it has two cores, four cores. So remember that picture I showed of parallelism, that what supercomputer programmers do is they have to write code in parallel. Now we write code for 700,000 cores, but remember, supercomputers are also a time machine. So we're now at the point where you, in your computers, have multiple cores. You already have four cores. And the future programmer here will have to write parallel programs. OK, so what's happening with Exascale? So uh, President Obama has said uh, several years ago that an Exascale, designing and building an Exascale computer, uh, is an enormous challenge for the nation. And we need to do this. We need to attack this challenge. And what is really encouraging is that we also have a letter signed by 24 senators, both Republicans and Democrats, saying we need to take on this challenge. It's an uh, international challenge as well. We have other competitors who are working on this problem uh, sort of alongside us. So with respect to exascale computer computing, we're sort of poised, ready to do that. And uh, the next step is really sort of uh, pushing forward with a real plan, and the DOE has been working on that plan. In fact, uh, uh, some of you may have read that Obama is coming here, uh, President Obama is coming here tomorrow, and uh, I apologize, that might have been why you had trouble uh, driving in <laughs> um, uh, uh, as well. So now let's uh, start trying to taper down and look at some other areas and wrap up. Big data. So. Uh, you know, the, the word that you're hearing when you read the newspaper every day is big data, big data, big data. What's happening with big data? Well, big data is slightly different than what we've been showing with respect to simulation. With simulation, we have formulas. We use those formulas for gravity and other things, and then we're able to calculate and model things. What happens with big data, big data, as people are calling it, is they're collecting information and then trying to use that to optimize things. So UPS, for example, put sensors in all of their vehicles. They put tracking, GPS tracking devices, how many, where they turned right, where they turned left, 46,000 vehicles. They take all that data, they crunch on it, and they find out that by changing routes, by changing habits, they can uh, save 8.4 million gallons of fuel and cut 85 million miles off their routes. So how do they do that? It's data. It's collecting data and analyzing it. They don't have the equation ahead of time. They're looking for a pattern and looking for ways, it's ways the data can be used. One of the things that you could do is when you go home is you could look at this uh, website, opencityapps.org. The city of Chicago, surprisingly, is one of the most data-friendly cities. They collect a whole bunch of data about the city, where the snow plows are. So, and they make that public. So someone has gone off and they've written a, an app that is here, it's so called Clear Streets, right? So what they did, they harvested that data, they decided where the snow plows had been, and they were able to plot, okay, well, here's a map that shows you where the streets are clear after a snow. Other folks have uh, analyzed the data for school systems, uh, for crime, for business. There's a whole number of ways that when you get data, not knowing the formula ahead of time, you're able to look back on the data. You may have seen recently there was a newspaper uh, article that scientists had sort of reconstructed an ancient language by looking at over 600 languages, in this case sort of data mining those languages, looking at the languages and saying, what are the similarities? Again, a data problem without the formula to start with. And by looking at the patterns, sort of calculate back and say, what would the root language have been l you know, most like? What do we know about the root language? Another example is a sky survey known as the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. This is a survey that's trying to piece together every possible image and every possible piece of information we have about the universe. And when we have that information, again, we can essentially ask queries, ask database questions about our universe and get understanding based on, on cr creating a database of all that information. Another place that data is happening, uh, that data is becoming very exciting, is your DNA sequence, your genome. So uh, we know now that certain treatments are better for certain people just based on their differences. You know, that you're allergic to some things, uh, your particular 
uh, um, heritage uh, means that certain drugs you're uh, more likely to respond to. And so there are folks now who are looking at mining that information and based on getting a sequence when you go to the hospital, they could tell you what drug would be most effective uh, without having to cycle you through five or six. That's the kind of data problem that uh, people are working on now. Of course, as we look further forward, we see where we might end up. So some of you may have seen uh, uh, Watson uh, in the Jeopardy challenge. So now running back to Alan Turing, Alan Turing also, the guy who sort of created computers, the first computer scientist, we consider the first computer scientist, he also came up with a famous uh, uh, idea which we call the Turing test. And it's modeled after a parlor game in the early, you know, people used to actually play parlor games. They would play charades. They'd do stuff like that rather than watch TV. I, I know it's hard to believe. And uh, this parlor game was they would have a group of people and send a male and a female into another room. And then the group in the parlor could write down questions for person A or person B. Now, person A or person B was trying to hide whether they were male or female. So you would write down questions like, uh, write down your favorite poem. And based on what you got back from person A or person B, you would try to guess, are they, were they the man or were they the woman? So Turing, thinking about that game, decided, you know what? We shouldn't argue about whether a computer is really thinking. We should just have the same test. If they can fool us into thinking that we think that they're human, then they're intelligent. So the computer is intelligent based on the Turing test. Can you fool a human into thinking you're intelligent? Now, that might be easier with some folks than others. Uh, but IBM decided, well, if we're going to do this, let's put it to the real test. Let's play Jeopardy. So they took on this fantastic challenge of playing Jeopardy. And now that computer is being used and has already been sold. It's now been downsized and shrunk into smaller boxes. It's already being used by medical industry because the number of journal articles, the number of things that, the, that Watson can reference. So when you ask a question about a drug interaction, that Watson can know that they can say, oh, yeah, okay, and, they, and it even gives you the paper reference. So we're likely to see this in your uh, uh, insurance care somewhere along the line that the insurance company is making sure that you're getting the most effective treatment. Okay, so are we at the end of Moore's Law? Well, we're already down very small, and over the next uh, 10 years, we will have shrunk the size of a transistor until it is just a handful of atoms. At that point, it's pretty hard to shrink it anymore uh, and get reliable numbers out. So people are already looking at other forms of computing, computing sort of back to mechanical, computing with proteins, or qu computing using the quantum states of, uh, of atoms. Another thing that's happening right now is instead of the standard chip being one chip, is stacking them up so we can add power. Now, the, the, the real only downside to stacking computers is that they get a lot hotter that way, as you might imagine. So coming up with exotic technologies to cool these is, has to go hand in hand with stacking them this way. And finally, let's look at scrolling the time machine backward. So I told you how, my lap, how the supercomputer becomes a laptop. If you go backwards far enough, you also get to really cheap devices. So as computers uh, come out the other end of the time machine, they get to the point where there are things like this. So this is a Raspberry Pi. It's a computer that you can buy for $25, $30. And it's a full computer. This plugs into your monitor, boots up, runs a web browser. You can get on the network, everything. So th the shrunk all the way down, this little tiny chip on the L key is a computer that a company has developed which they hope someday will be encapsulated and be small enough that you can swallow it. The idea being that with sensors you could swallow it and it could take measurements inside your body from the right side instead of from the outside. And so these computers also get shrunk the other way. Now let me also make a pitch here that there, were, there was a time when people had hobbies uh, that uh, uh, actually built things, you know, train sets, ham radio, other things. These are the new hobby for people who are want to experiment. This uh, little tiny piece uh, here that uh, Raj used is an Arduino. It's, uh, you know, 15, 20 bucks. 
And uh, the whole, aside from the tree <laughs> stump, you know, those whole parts in here are, you know, tens of dollars of parts. That's it. So I really encourage people to go back to hobbying, to actually having a hobby that builds things, that constructs things like we used to do. In fact, uh, Argonne has a great uh, set of uh, uh, programs for students, and we encourage lots of folks to come here. I see there are some students here very well dressed as well. Um, so Argonne has a number of programs. Uh, um, they didn't have any programs when I was a kid, uh, uh, but they, I was able to try out ham radio uh, with my dad uh, as a kid. So I hope that what happens here is that folks are very much encouraged that, that to start down that path of exploration, scientific exploration with computing uh, especially. So where is Argonne going? And this is our last slide here. So we hope very much to be the place that fields the first exascale computer. Uh, I'm responsible for the software uh, uh, group uh, at, uh, that works on some of the operating system and other pieces for our high performance computing group and uh, responsible in the DOE for helping to coordinate the software strategy uh, inside the DOE and we are very hopeful that the country will start on a program uh, uh, in full force. We've started initially but really sort of plowing forward to build the next set of technologies for exascale computing. And we hope as well, on the same end, not from the computer scientists, but from the computational scientist side, that we look at discoveries that will happen in computational science. New materials, clean energy, better batteries. These are the sort of things that we model with those supercomputers. And with that, I think we're wrapped up, although I did want to thank Raj again for uh, uh, designing our, uh, our gadget here. So anyway, with that, uh, uh, thank you. So what's the, uh, what's the, is Eleanor here? What's the standard status here, or, or uh, Robin, what am I supposed to do? I think it's question and answer time, and uh, there, is, there are people with microphones. While they're getting the microphone, uh, let me say that uh, um, if you want to come up and take a look at any of these parts up here, you're welcome to. Uh, I thought this was great. My dad sent me this uh, tube. This is from Motorola. Um, you know, they, they did make things before cell phones, uh, so uh, there's actually, uh, they did make tubes, if you remember. Uh, so who has a question? question. Oh, great. Yes. Exactly. Yes, um, so the, the question is about quantum computing, and uh, now this is where physicists have to get up and talk about uh, uh, the quantum states of atoms, but basically the computer can be constructed by assembling a set of, of molecules, a set of atoms, or a set of atoms, and their quantum state can be used to encode or search a set of patterns. And one of the things that, as you pointed out, that's very remarkable about this is uh, people in the laboratory have created one or two of these bits or three or four but if you could keep them stable and run for a long time you could solve problems like the one I said about this room and encryption problems so one of the fascinating things would be that the encryption that we use today would become possibly obsolete with the right uh, uh, powerful enough uh, quantum computer it would be too easy because again we rely on encryption being hard who else had a question? Yep. Thank you for a very nice talk. And uh, the question I have today is everybody in the room hears it all the time. That's hacking of computers from foreign countries and so on, taking uh, both our discoveries or messing up our grid system. Is the EXA uh, EXA working on that too? Or? So um, we are the for the large scale computers that's an excellent question for large scale computers we're not using this in terms of cybersecurity in terms of protection we're modeling things there are folks who run models on our computer to try to understand cybersecurity better but we have a different part of the laboratory who works on that a cybersecurity team and in particular 
uh, it is true that one of the problems is that with so much tech, you know, I have, when I go on travel, I have an iPad and an iPhone and a laptop. With so many different things, they all have to be protected and up to date on all the software. And uh, it makes, because we have so much now, it means that we have to be extra diligent in, uh, in protection. So we have a group at the lab who looks at that, but that's not what we've been doing with our uh, supercomputers. I have a question. Yes. What hope is there that we can reduce the amount of heat and energy usage? It's a good, very good question. So the questions about heat and how much uh, these computers use, one fantastic thing, we've hit that wall of how fast the clock speed is. It's forced the companies to become more energy efficient. In fact, uh, our machine here is 20 times faster than the previous machine, but it's about four or five times more energy efficient. So every generation of computing device now, because we've hit that wall, is more energy efficient because they, they kind of have to be. So uh, if you notice your, your iPad or your iPhone, the battery life on that thing is amazing. If you think back on your first uh, cell phone, when you turned on your first cell phone, uh, you know, every you know, six hours or so, it looked like the battery was about dead. So uh, because our computers have become more efficient, uh, that energy, that energy usage is uh, becoming a better, uh, it's becoming much better for us. Um, yeah, I have uh, two quick questions. Uh, the first is, how competitive and how cooperative is the field of supercomputing, um, both internationally and within the U.S.? So it is very, uh, um, cooperative uh, and competitive, as you said. So for example, uh, tomorrow I'm headed to Japan uh, to work with the supercomputer folks there uh, on some joint projects that we do because uh, the science for the writing of this software is really more complex than any one team can do. So we work together on some of the projects. Uh, we write open source code. In fact, all of the code that we run the supercomputer with, uh, if you had one at home, you would be able to download and l use some of this computer. In fact, a lot of folks download the computer and run it on their clusters. But when it comes to designing the physical part of the machine, the Blue Gene Q or Fujitsu or uh, Bull in France, when it comes to designing the physical part, this is where uh, there is an intense competition and uh, it's very uh, protected with patents and with uh, uh, trade secrets. Okay, um, second question. Uh, I was gonna ask, uh, supercomputing is used a lot in the field of modeling physics. Yes. And um, you see that with the weather and the, and the jet engines and things like that. But it can also be used in other applications like for modeling social problems or um, anything. Do you think there's an expanding field for solving different problems? And what do you think those problems will be? That's a, that's a great question. So. I focused mostly on sort of physics and chemistry related problems, but there are folks who are working on problems that are uh, uh, social, even cultural. So uh, reconstructing uh, languages as an example, but um, we've worked with the University of Chicago and looking at uh, uh, pictures from uh, monuments and 3D scans of monuments and trying to recreate things in that way. People are looking at uh, social networks and trying to understand uh, uh, the data there. And people are applying uh, these sort of uh, uh, computational uh, capabilities more and more to the big data problem. And it's, uh, we see this a lot. I mean, I'm sure you read about it with uh, uh, Target. There was a fantastic story in the New York Times uh, about uh, how Target was able to look back through their data and figure out when it was the right time to send flyers to people because they could predict when, based on purchasing habits, when there was going to be a baby in the family. So uh, people would start buying, for example, unscented uh, items, unscented lotion. And these triggers, b based on looking through the data, they realized, oh, it's about time to send them a flyer, right? So it's this sort of computing that uh, is really uh, taken off over the last uh, few years. Someone have a... Do neural networks offer a possible path to exascale computing, given that Mother Nature has found a way to pack 
astounding processing capabilities and some very modest creatures? That's a, that's a great question. So one of the, uh, there are several projects uh, in Europe and in the US that are modeling the human brain using, in fact, they've run on our machine before, uh, modeling the human brain, trying to understand how it works. One of the principles in how the brain works is something called a neural net. Now, interestingly though, we haven't found them to be very good at computing in the way we compute. So it's much the same way, you know, the way birds fly versus the way we fly. Um, we haven't yet figured out how to write programs or even design machines that would leverage, you know, how, how we're built. Uh, and it may be that we never do. We may find out that silicon, I mean, it may be the case that the way we design things with silicon is always going to lend itself to the same sort of von Neumann style architecture, uh, not the architecture that I happen to have. Uh, other questions? So uh, the way they start is, uh, uh, that's a great question, is often they start with the algorithm. So, and this is a, can be a very much a paper and pencil operation in that a whiteboard is thinking through, like the envelope sort, like looking at that formula, thinking through how am I going to divide my problem up. Eventually then, they're typing f uh, 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 computer code into a text editor. You know, we really are just type stuff into what looks like a typewriter window. Uh, and we can do that from a coffee shop. Uh, and so I know a lot of folks who sit uh, on a comfortable chair uh, or at a coffee shop and they have that green uh, uh, style window that I had up on my computer here. Uh, I don't know if it's still up uh, here. This is uh, sort of looking back on, on uh, old school. This is... Uh You know, they, they sit there, uh, uh, I'll, I'll stop the program here. This was the program running that uh, we had. So they sit there and they're typing commands into their computer and uh, make building a program which then is saved and loaded into the computer. They also, folks now rely on lots of libraries that are written by other folks. So the, you know, the world has written software that we can reuse. There are libraries that do matrix uh, operations. There are libraries that do uh, FFTs. There are libraries that uh, do special kinds of grids and meshes. And you can just sort of rely on those being there and pull them into your project. So uh, Fortran, C, C++, uh, sometimes Python. Uh, Python is becoming a more popular one. And uh, uh, um, uh, some folks are even writing their own languages occasionally. Other questions? Yes. Oh, how much does a computer like Mira cost? To cost. <laughs> it's too much. Um, so, uh, in general, the top tier computers are about a hundred million dollars. Uh, now, it's hard to put an exact price because uh, uh, for the first guy, because the first folks who develop the computer develop it with the vendor and pay the vendor, pay the company like IBM to help design it. It's the folks who buy serial number you know, 20 and 30 that get the great discount. The guys who are there first designing it uh, uh, are, have also paid for some of the engineering. But they're about $100 million, and we expect that price to not go down. That's really you're, you're buying the most computer you can. And uh, we also pay about a $1 million a megawatt for power. So our machine now is about 5 megawatts. Uh, we hope to not go up over 10 or 15 megawatts. Uh, an exascale computer has been predicted that we might have to top out at 20 megawatts, which would start making it very costly in terms of uh, ComEd, right, at $20 million a year electric bill. Uh, you hope that you are able to call the president anytime you want uh, and ask for more power. Other questions? Oh, there's one. So it looks like uh, you know to handle the uh, big data, and uh, I I thought you know that there are like two trends, right? One is you know to continue to increase the scale of the a single computer, right? Build a, a 
the super and the super computer. Exactly. It's one way. The other way now, um, so I thought that they tried to use a cheap computer, uh, try to build a, a super cluster, uh, you know, uh, uh, room of cheap computers together. And uh, so going forward, um, so what's your take on that? Is, is this yeah, that's a... No, it's a, it's a very good question because it separates sort of two different architectures that are important. The architecture I talked about when I said supercomputer, the super part about it, in addition to being able to do math very quickly, for example, Mira can do about a million floating point operations for per second for every person on the planet. So uh, 7 billion people, Mira can do about a million operations per 7 billion people every second. That has flops, it has floating point operations, but it also is very fast network. The length of time it takes, remember that algorithm I showed you, the parallel algorithm? You have to send messages, and that requires super communications. So that's one style computer. The style computer that Google uses is a completely different style computer. They may have thousands, and they do have thousands and thousands of computers, but for search engine results, you don't have to sum all the data across all the computers very rapidly. You store search engine results can be stored essentially on one computer. So all of the searches that involve the word tree can be on one part of the computer, on another part. So you only need to gather two or three pieces to provide an answer. So those kind of computers we call are loosely coupled and they can use very inexpensive computer parts because the time for sending data back and forth can be a hundred, a thousand times, ten thousand times slower. So this really does separate the architecture space into two kinds of architecture. Uh, yes, I had a quick question for you. Uh, I'm right over here. Um, Ray Kurzweil and a few uh, futurists have had buzz lately, maybe the last 15 years, regarding uh, the replication, uh, approximately as possible, of the whole neuron connections in the brain, dendrites and all that. Are we? Do you think we're going to reach that point? Replication as of? As far, as far as just replicating all the connections in a human brain and reaching an AI equivalent. Right. Where it's going to start wagging the tail, wag the dog, so to speak. Yeah. Well, so uh, um, I have sort of a, uh, a more philosophical uh, response, which I believe that the, the creator is always m uh, greater than the created. So no matter what we build, I believe, we are still the creator and they are still the created. And uh, so in, with respect to computers, even if we build Watson and it can answer uh, health data better than any person on the planet, uh, I'm not so worried about that. It still really is that we have constructed. It took our intellect to construct that. So, uh, but we're really close to ha applying that in other fields. We've already, I mean, Watson shows that not only can you build it, you can make money from it. Uh, and, and those usually are two different things. So uh, IBM is uh, doing very well in fielding this device. Uh, all right. We have another one back there. Uh, Dr. Beckman, I've been thinking a lot about what you were saying about the heat that a, that a supercomputer generates. Uh, you know, all these electrons going through the wire. What is it exactly that generates the heat and are there certain instructions or operations that generate more heat than other <laughs> operations? Well, wow, that's a great question. So it is exactly what you said. It's the, it's the movement of electrons that generates the heat. And in fact, when you look at the computer architecture, because as we remember, I showed you that picture of exascale and sort of these graphs tailing off. So now we're in trouble with respect to the design. And one of the things that as we look now, where are we using power? Where are we generating heat? And it's where you move data. So we're looking very carefully at our architectures and saying, instead, the von Neumann architecture says, I'm going to take a piece of data that's in memory, remember that storage pad, move it to the CPU, add it to another number, and then move it back into memory. Well, that motion might be unneeded. What if I could put the CPU and the memory essentially together and reduce this, the distance that the, the electrons have to travel. And so these first 3D stacked chips that I described are looking at taking a CPU on the bottom of the stack, putting memory on the next layer up, and then not having any other part of the computer. 
So the entire computer becomes one chip. So you don't have memory chips. You wouldn't see, so right now if you look at our, this is an old version, this is BlueGene P, you can see the CPU here and you see the black chips here. These are the memory chips, which means that all of the computation is you know, pushing data, pushing uh, information back and forth. Putting it all into one chip where the data has to travel a few uh, microns uh, is, the, is a great step to reducing the power. And we believe that that architecture is probably uh, what you'll see in the next few years. Uh, yeah, I have another question. Um, cloud computing is talked about a lot in yeah. uh, this kind of context. So I was just wondering, do you think pushing a lot of the actual computation onto a lot of the computing power that we carry around in our pockets nowadays would be a way to get around the issues of heat and things like that that come with a co-located supercomputer? Yeah, so uh, the, the cloud computing is a way in which we put essentially a whole lot of servers in a very well-maintained uh, environment, and then we use those servers to do the computation that we just get a client side, we get a little interface for on our computer, uh, on our handheld, on our laptop. And that is very efficient. It doesn't work so well uh, for supercomputing in terms of the, what we call the cloud, unless the cloud is just Mira, because again, the distance between the, com the, the compute elements, it's that speed which we have to shrink. We, for us to do computation, we need those processors to be very close to each other. And so the reason this is in fact a custom motherboard uh, in some sense, right? Th there is no other part of the computer. In a standard computer in your house, you have the VGA adapter and all that other stuff. This has a CPU and memory. That's it. And there's a network connection and they're very close. They just stack them right up to each other. Uh, so that we can have the fastest connection between these. Okay, so uh, Eleanor, what's the, the protocol here? Let, uh, let me take one last question here. I'm not sure how we generally wrap up, but it sounds like we probably should. I'm sorry again about the gate. Uh. Yeah, quick question. Um, if you wanted to have a career writing software for supercomputers, what kind of skills would you need to have uh, as being desirable on your resume? Oh, wow. Good question. So uh, uh, there are really two paths, uh, I would say. So one is as a computer scientist. So that's uh, uh, someone like me and other folks who took classic computer science uh, classes and then uh, sort of along the way or took other classes that were respect to parallel programming, parallelism, and then scientific uh, math. Another option and remember that the computers here we, we use, we write the code, we write software for it, but we also write the science. We write the science application. So another path are folks who take applied math and learn the mathematics and the physics behind these simulations, and then they add computer science to understand how to map those things onto the computer. So we end up with different roles. We work together. Uh, so those movies that you saw were created with computer scientists, computer scientists who are graphics uh, specialists, people who handle programming and uh, uh, communication libraries, and then applied mathematicians. And then we all sit together uh, in this building <laughs> right here. OK. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Pete will be up here if you want a couple more questions afterwards. Again, great job, Pete.